Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. Guess what? It's time to buckle your theological safety belt because Miguel de la Torre is on the podcast talking about his brand new book, The Politics of Jesus, a Hispanic political theology, which may or may not, and, and may would be the correct answer, a challenge to Yoder's politics of Jesus. Anyway, this conversation happened while I was at the General Assembly of the Disciples of Christ. He was leading the justice track, and me and Spencer were leading the innovation track uh, from the Hatchery LA, where I'm uh, now the Director of Theology and the Humanities. And we were like, we got to get together, even though we're both talking at the same time. So we did. I used this microphone and recorded an excellent conversation. But before we jump into it, and before you go to homebrewedchristianity.com to link and buy this book that he's about to persuade you to get but through the homebrewed link. So I get a kickback. You know what I'm saying? This is free. Um, before that, I just want you to know that when we started to record this podcast was the very moment the flag was being raised at the embassy, like the bridging of the gap between the United States and Cuba. And Miguel de la Torre is a Cuban exile theologian in the United States. Um, I mean, he's written tons of books, which I had read. I had not read the new book that we ended up talking quite a bit about. But he is experiencing the joy of the end of the embargo where he can visit his family and go back. And he finds out that his daughter got into the college she wanted to go to. So he is pumped and excited. And then we get to talk liberation theology and his new book, The Politics of Jesus. So... Uh, it is tons of fun. So before we jump in, just want you to know that you are invited to join the Homebrewed Christianity community. That are the people that join each week uh, and a number of all the extra assortments that happen at Homebrewed. You have high gravity classes like the one we just figured, like finished up, Postmodern Theologies. You have the Epic Reads class that Philip Clayton and I are doing every month throughout the year where we're going to read different epic texts. Uh, if you're a member of the Homebrewed Christianity community, um, then you get to participate in all these things. You get really sweet uh, pint cards, which you pull out when we're together, and I have to rant for three minutes about some random topic, uh, which if you listen to Theology and Throwdown, in a couple episodes you'll hear a collection of rants about topics of all sorts. But I have not decided whether or not I can release a rant about the superiority of the Spurs to the Lakers in uh, the NBA, because that was straight heresy. Hashtag Kobe Bryant. Anyway, uh, think about joining the Homebrewed Christianity community that not only supports podcasts, you get tons of extra content and all that kind of stuff. And think about meeting up at a live event. There's a whole host of them coming your way. But the biggest, most exciting one is going to be um, in November, November 4th, pre-gaming for the Subverting the Norm Conference, which if you sign up, you can use the code HBCSTN, you get the best discount possible, and I'll buy you a free beverage at the brewery during the event. Um, if you go for the pregame for Subverting the Norm in Springfield, Missouri, Jack Caputo and I, one day event, Theology Nerd Boot Camp, when philosophers talk about God. That's right. Jack Caputo, like top 10 living philosopher, and me, who's not a top 10 much of anything, but I do have a podcast talking about philosophers, talking about God. You can come hang out with us, do it in the next two weeks. That's when you get the cheapest ticket, only 30 people. And we're hanging out for a day and then going out for dinner, beverages, get a selfie with Jack, which is what every theology nerd really wants for Christmas. And you have tons of fun at subverting the norm. There's also going to be a live podcast, Johnny, you know, the ex cold war kids, guitar player. And I, have a whole new striper cover song we're going to, <laughs> to do at the podcast along with things with just Catherine keller and the whole host of subverting the norm peeps uh head on over to homebrewchristianity.com you can link through click through all the details if you've never rated or viewed the podcast you should do it because it makes your life feel better especially if you give it a five rating and say anything you could even be horrible but if you give it a five rating that'd be awesome Anyway, uh, share the brew and go get yourself the politics of Jesus. This interview's awesome. When I got done, me 
and my friend Wally, who was sitting silently in the background, we were going to go talk, and then we were all like emotional. It was like, that was freaking awesome. And it was. Because Miguel De La Torre just told us some amazing stuff. Enjoy. Peace out. Hi, I'm Manny Perez, and I'm editing this podcast. And I like to give Trip a hard time about pronouncing Spanish names. It's Miguel De La Torre, and the book is called The Politics of Jesus. Carry on. Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and there's nothing quite as exciting as getting a world-renowned ethicist to call your phone at the Disciples of Christ General Assembly and saying, hey, I'll talk to you. And then you find out he doesn't know quite exactly what he signed up for, but nonetheless, you've not run away. <laughs> so uh, thank you uh, for joining us on the podcast. Thank you for, um, for for coming and hanging out with all the disciples. And uh, thank you for talking. Before you, Are you going headed back to Islef? I'm heading back to Islef uh, in a few hours. All right. But it's great to be here. So before you do anything, I want to hear... What is it like seeing the embassy and everything going on at Cuba? Um, and you're finding out your daughter's getting graduated. I feel like there's like lots of excitement and uh, uh, things worth celebrating right now in your life. That might be a good way of letting everyone get to know just a bit about you. Sure. Well, I am a Cuban. Um, I was born on the island. so And I left the island um, over 55 years ago. So to actually see these uh, the flag going on up in the Cuban embassy, to see that we are moving away from the hostility of the Cold War, which only, um, you know, the embargo only hurt the people on the island, um, is very emotional. It's very exciting that hopefully we're moving into a new age. Um, I am looking back to, to returning to Cuba as soon as I can. Um, I just received my Cuban passport a few d- days ago, as a matter awesome. of fact. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, um, to visiting the island of my birth. Mm-hmm. So, so um, I, I know I was assigned uh, your text in school, read it, and then I found out that you were actually did your um, MDiv at Southern Seminary, right. where a number of my professors at Wake Forest Div School um, were, and now you're at Isla. So, uh, have you been Baptist your whole life? Um, no, I what? haven't. No, no. I, I was, I was, uh, I grew up in a Catholic household, but it was very nominal Catholic. Uh, Catholic. I mean, I went to Blessed Sacrament as an elementary school, so mm-hmm. I was in elementary school doing Vatican II, and that was very influential. But my parents practiced Santeria, which is an Afro-Cuban religion, mm-hmm. um, a mixture of Catholicism and the Orisha traditions of Africa. It was the religion of the slaves when they came to Cuba. So there was this hybridity of spirituality. Um, I became a Southern Baptist in my um, early 20s for very, very deep theological reasons. Uh, the young girl I wanted to go out with would only go out with me if I went to church with her on Sunday, and she happened to be a Southern Baptist. Well, So that's how I became a Southern Baptist, which I always say I'm glad she wasn't waiting for the, com- uh, the spaceship behind the comet, or else I would really be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, it, 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 at what point? Um, in your own life, did you become interested in doing academic theology and ethics? Well, it's interesting because I grew up um, as a conservative fascist, interesting enough. I was very conservative, very um, anti-women's lib, LGBT. I mean, you name it, I was against it. Um, I ran for public office as the most conservative Republican for the Florida House of Representatives. Um, so... For me, it was ethics was, you know, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, mm-hmm. um, and the church should be the one helping individuals, not the government. Well, you know, along the way of my education, um, I began to read writings from, um, from Latin America, from, from specifically from liberation theologians. And, and that radically changed me. It, it helped explain why I lived in poverty, why I grew up in poverty, Mm -hmm. that it wasn't my parents' fault or my fault necessarily because we were working hard. Um, At that point, my consciousness was raised, and I have what I really call my conversion experience. Mm -hmm. That's when I began to realize that um, if I'm going to be a Christian, then I must be in solidarity with the least of these. Mm -hmm. And in that work of solidarity, 
um, all these very conservative um, um, views began to melt away as I became an advocate for the very things I was mm-hmm. uh, working against in my early life. Mm-hmm. So I feel like, um, like any new convert, there's a zeal <laughs> that exists where I'm trying to undo a lot of the damage that I did in my early life um, when I was politically active. Mm-hmm. Well, I know a lot of people have those type of awakenings, and then you're stuck not just figuring out what does it mean to embody these new convictions and rethink through your faith, but you're also trying to figure out what to do with the old version of yourself, Mm -hmm. but also your friends or family could still be there. Yeah. Um, How, as someone who's been able to walk with students through these issues uh, at the master's and at PhD level, um, how, how could you kind of give words of wisdom for people on figuring out how to love the old version of yourself and family and friends, but also be true and invite and encourage and prod along in a positive way. Well, one of the symbolism of Christianity um, is that to be saved, mm-hmm. you need to um, crucify, be crucified, um, and only then does rebirth occur. So in a very real way, I had to crucify my sexism, my heterosexism, my classism, my racism onto the cross in order to become a new creature. Mm -hmm. Now, in that process, like you mentioned, um, I lost pretty much all my friends of before who thought something, you know, I I must have gone mad. Um, My relationship with my family um, uh, had became very strained, um, to, to say the least. But you know, I, I, if you put your whether you put your hand on the plow, but you look back, you're not worthy. So, so I had to plow forward, um, and, and I think that's part of what the Christian faith is supposed to be. Um, you know, working towards um, your salvation in fear and trembling, and, mm-hmm. and, and working this out. But not just Christian faith. I think any part of humanity needs to be moving forward towards a more liberative society. Um, even if a person is not religious, these are the things that we, sh- you know, that I think define our very humanity. Mm-hmm. So, if you if you were like to to go back in time and hear you running for Congress, how would you begin a conversation with yourself? Yeah. Well, it wasn't Congress; it was the Florida House of Florida Representatives. House, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. I think if I would have heard myself now back then, um, I would have just dismissed myself mm-hmm. um, as just being some angry Latino. And therefore, if I could dismiss that, I don't have to really pay attention to what I was saying. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's interesting, you know, that there, there was this, this certainty that I had back then. And I think now that I'm, as I, as I have more gray hair, um, I'm realizing that I'm more ambiguous on, on things of certainty. Mm-hmm. So that allows me, I think, really to, to wrestle with new ideas. Um, and, and to continue to grow. And I think that's part of the excitement of life. Mm-hmm. So when, when, when you're uh, talking with students who, I mean, like, I remember the first time I read uh, John Sabrino's Jesus the Liberator. Mm-hmm. It was in Frank Tupper's theology class. And like, I read through it, and then I was like, I'm going to have to read this again devotionally. Mm-hmm. And then he read through it again, and all of Scripture starts to look different. The way you relate to people, mm-hmm. you start to see power dynamics in relationships you didn't notice before. Like, well, one of the things I've always been interested in or trying to figure out is how is it that you kind of share the vision of liberation theology or describe it in a way that doesn't come off to people that are uh, blindly, fiercely protective of their privilege uh, in, in a way that, that they see it? Because, like, if I, if I'm like, if I could put. When I stayed up till three to finish Jesus the Liberator in a bottle and you drank it, you would not want to not go back. But I can't describe it to you where you aren't getting defensive. And, uh, and does that make sense? It does. It does. And, and quite frankly, if I'm totally honest with you, um, I would have been defensive also in my earlier life. Mm -hmm. If if somebody was to come to me and, and really push me on my, on my, on my privilege and, and, and of where I was at the time. Um, and I think that's only natural. And I think, what that does for me, at least, is it makes me a little bit more patient mm-hmm. with people who are defensive because, you know, they're, they're also was I. Um, but I think, you know, for, for, for those who claim to be Christians, um, you cannot read the biblical text without seeing this message of liberation. 
you, you cannot look at the life of Jesus without seeing his constant um, um, actions um, in solidarity with, with, with the least of his time. Mm-hmm. And if I say that this is what I want to be, that this is what I want to follow, that this is what I want to be a disciple of, um, it, it revolutionizes you. Mm-hmm. You, you. There's no other word. Unless I choose not to read or not to know, and just make church into a country club that just is something that I go once a week and meet my friends and move on with life. I know, but if I wanted a country club, I would want a bar. So that's yeah. one of the <laughs> things of avoiding a church is a country club. Uh, I remember the um, James Dunn, who recently passed, uh, worked for the Baptist uh, Joint Committee. He taught ethics. Um, um, w- w- one time he said something that just always stuck. I'd done a presentation, you know, like a student just regurgitating the content well to everyone on Gutierrez. And he's like, that's good. And he goes, well, trip. Uh, but I can't even do the South Texas accent, <laughs> but anytime anyone has a good one, it's always, always good. And he says, trip, just remember, you're saying this like if it's completely obvious, but you forgot you're worshiping a dead homeless Jew. <laughs> you gotta always make sure, like once people get that Jesus was a dead homeless Jew, killed by the Romans, then, well, everything else you said just sticks out. But I really feel like you didn't put enough dirty Galilee in it. And <laughs> and I thought to myself, I remember thinking, what a weird response from a professor. But he had, he, he was a lively man. But then you sit and think about it and go, yeah, like the Bible, it's all sitting there. And I've read it, memorized huge chunks of it so I could out Jesus friends, right. like any good Baptist sword drill champ. But the moment... The, the dust of Galilee and everything is there. The text itself just breathes liberation. It does. And it's not immediately obvious to so many of us with stuff on our eyes. So could you, could you give me like a, a picture of how you describe, uh, like taking historical criticism, the experience of people on the margins and taking it back into reading the text so it, so it breathes the dust of Galilee? So, in a um, shameless act of self-promotion... Oh, no, it'd be great. That's what... Uh, <laughs> um, two weeks ago, on July 1st, my newest book was published, um, and it's called The Politics of Jesus. Mm-hmm. So, it's uh, Jesus with an accent on the U, so you have the Spanish, and it's how to do Christology with an accent. Oh, that's awesome. Basically. And, and obviously, it's a response. Well, I'll say it again as everyone's going to Amazon.com right now. <laughs> I drive, pull, pull off the side of the road. Now, okay, say it again. <laughs> it's called the politics of Jesus uh, towards a, a political theology. Mm-hmm. And obviously, it's a, because of the title, is a response to Yoda. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the argument that I'm trying to make is that, you know, Yoda, when he writes the politics of Jesus, uh, lo and behold, he discovers a Jesus who's a pacifist Mennonite. Um, and I'm thinking, oh, that's fine. Um, but what if I, as a Latino, was to read the Gospels? What would mm-hmm. I find? So I read my own context into the mm-hmm. biblical text, and I discover a Jesus, which is very different than the Jesus that many people follow. Yeah. And I would even argue, um, like James Cone does, mm-hmm. that sometimes those Jesuses could be very satanic. Yeah. And and Jesus becomes a corrective. To make sure that we, as you say, um, you know, of, uh, 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 with the dust of Galilee. Um, you know, if I could just give one quick example of what, what I'm trying to get at. Um, when Jesus is crucified, a Roman soldier says, truly this was a righteous man. Um, the, um, um, James in his epistle writes, um, um, the prayer of a righteous of a righteous man availeth much. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, um, "Blessed are those who are righteous, for they shall inherit the earth." So, 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 so I, what I'm trying to argue is that the word righteousness um, is one of those words that um, basically means you can be righteous by yourself. If you're stuck in a deserted island, you could be righteous by having good thoughts, praying, doing rituals. But in Spanish. Justicia, which is the Latin word, is translated as justice. Mm-hmm. So it changes the meaning of the scripture. So um, truly this was a man of justice. Um, the prayer of the just availeth much. Blessed are the just, for they will inherit the earth. So, so it changes the meaning. And also, more importantly, 
you cannot do justice by yourself on a deserted island. You yeah. need other people. So it becomes a communal faith. So this is one of the difference between Jesus and Jesus. Mm-hmm. Jesus forces us to an ethics of community and an ethics of action, of doing justice, while Jesus moves us more towards a solitary, individualistic righteousness. Mm-hmm. So, so this is one of the ways that I think that what I'm trying to do in the book, and this is one example uh, in, in this, this particular book, is to correct the Jesus of the dominant culture that has become so much a reflection of that same culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's great. And I, now I'm excited about reading it. Um, the, so w- when you're when you're deciding to to begin a project like that, and in in looking at like this uh, reading the politics of Jesus in kind of contrast to Yoder's, but also um, where you're letting in intentionally your location as he, like if you read Politics of Jesus, uh, he assumes the 16th century could have written the text. Absolutely. Right? So uh, how do you respond to the people who are like, oh, no, 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 Miguel, you just look, look, just need you to, uh, if you just read the Bible, then it'll probably sound more like him. You're just doing this thing on the side. Mm-hmm. Like I find often that a lot of the critiques of liberation theologies are that, well, there's real systematic theology. It happens to all be Europeans. Mm-hmm. And then there's these little liberation yeah. theologies, and y'all use your stories more. That, and to me, that I mean, it, I don't know, once you notice it, it does sound horribly offensive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but it's even exists in the academy. And uh, so it's like, how do you invite people into that to recognizing that, you no, know, like actual proper theology as a disciple is done from within the actual life of discipleship, the community you're in, and there is no abstracted, perfect. Right free space elsewhere. And I think there's one of the problems that uh, many people within the academy have when they universalize their individual experience, Mm -hmm. when they make the exception of their life normative for everybody else. Mm -hmm. So what Yoda does is that he looks in the Bible, he sees a mirror and sees himself and says, ah, I've discovered the objective Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, What I argue in the book is that all of us are subjective. None of us uh, with finite minds can understand the infinite mind of God. Mm-hmm. So we all read into the biblical text and into God our own social context. The difference between me and Yoda is that while Yoda does not um, does not um, accept that, does not uh, c- confess it, I'm very willing to confess it and, and, and make the argument that I am reading this as a Latino man in the United States in the 21st century. And this interpretation is only good for this time period with this group, which will change in years. And that's the beauty of the message. Uh, you know, the, the, the message may remain the same, but, but, but the interpretations change to meet the needs of the people of each new generation. Mm-hmm. And, and a good, and you mentioned that, you know, the, the 16th century. How they interpreted the Bible in the 16th century is very different than the way we, uh, how, the way you Americans interpret the Bible today. Yeah. They just don't know their history. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Bible has always been reinterpreted in very different ways every single age. There has never, ever been a one way of interpreting the Bible from John the Baptist forward. Mm-hmm. So it, how would you describe the particularities of being a, a, a theologian uh, from Cuba but not having been home um, compared to, like, Sabrino tells stories of his particular yeah. base communities or the Gutierrez. Like, what is there a particular theme around exile and that kind of stuff that comes up? Oh, absolutely. In the book, for example, one of the stories that I spend a lot of time in is when Jesus goes down to Egypt. Mm-hmm. Um, Jesus, like myself, was a refugee. Yeah. He had to leave um, um, Jerusalem because of the, uh, the dictator who wanted to kill him. And I am positive that in Egypt, he talked with a funny accent, the way I speak with a funny accent. And I'm sure all the little Egyptian boys beat him up after school, the way uh, the Irish and the Italian boys used to beat me up after school. So I can relate to Jesus because Jesus understands that pain of being a refugee in a strange land and not being accepted, mm-hmm. which I think forms a major part of the gospel message. Now, most people who can go home, who, who, who are not refugees, probably read Jesus went down to, down to Egypt 
and just keep on reading and never pause on that particular verse. Yeah. We think, oh, it's helping the Moses typology for Matthew. Exactly. Um, but for me, to, to read that from my context, it brings not only that verse alive, it brings Jesus or Jesus alive in ways that, 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 that really ministers to my own soul. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's what it means to be a refugee for me. And, and in that, it's not just the story of Jesus itself, but I mean, you have Adam and Eve, who are also refugees, kicked out of the land from which they came from, mm-hmm. never being able to go back, but always living in the strange land, trying to recreate the memory of Eden. Um, Abraham was a refugee who left, uh, not a refugee, he was an immigrant, he left. Uh, he was an undocumented immigrant, um, being kicked out of each uh, country he, he would pass through. Mm-hmm. So, so you can't read the biblical text and not see the story of migration from, yeah. uh, from Eden all the way up to Jerusalem down to Egypt. And I think um, most people miss that because that's not their social context. But for those of us who are refugees, it's so obvious. How can, mm-hmm. how can you not see this? And I think that's what we bring to the conversation. Different social contexts brings different ways of seeing the beauty of the biblical text. Oh, yeah. So so if, if you're from, you spent time in Florida, right? Now I you're did. in Colorado. Yes. Uh, both of which are, uh, you're probably already seeing ads for the upcoming election. <laughs> Luckily, California, no one thinks we're going to change our mind about anything, so we don't have to watch them. Um, but uh, so when, when you're thinking of, 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 of your new book, thinking through Christology with Jesus, and then there's so much rhetoric on both sides around immigration and, uh, and the politics of it, the economics of it, uh, and whatever you call sitting in your hair piece is crazy stuff. That, that is so depressing. Like, you think to yourself, like, where did that come from? Yes. I, I thought that was my great grandpa was the last person to say <laughs> things like that. Uh, so, so how, how, can, can you help us, especially the ministers listening, give us helpful ways of describing the demonic powers that are at play yeah. in, in there so that we can, one, have a lot of congregates who've never admitted what they have or haven't dealt with around uh, race issues. And I mean, I'm a Southerner, so I, I regularly discover uh, lingering parts from my past. And, but also, maybe Jesus gives us a way of of having these conversations during election seasons with human dignity in mind. Yeah, yeah and, you know, a few, a few things on that. I think the first one that I mentioned, Jesus going down to um, Egypt. Mm-hmm. Um, Jesus, like I said, is a refugee, an immigrant, undocumented immigrant. So when Donald Trump is talking about immigrants uh, being rapists, he's talking about Jesus. Yeah. You know, and, and if not the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus of today mm-hmm. who shares that same name. Um, but, but also this, this, um, another part of the book, which I, I do want to lift up, which, which ties into what you're saying, and that is this theology of hopelessness that I've developed within the book itself. Um, in where looking at immigration specifically, I have very little hope that this is going to be something we're going to solve anytime soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, because too many people, i.e. the prison industrial complex is making way too much money. Mm-hmm. Uh, by having a broken immigration system. You know, we have more um, Latinos now in federal prison on immigration violation than any other ethnic group in the country. And, and these are private prison systems that yeah. spend a lot of PAC money to make sure that the laws are passed to make sure these individuals go to prison. See, the moment you say that, I bet you hear ministers going, oh, my God, I bet that's true. And there's no way I can tell that to my congregation because that just sounds complicated. They may not get it. And here we are right at the like <laughs> General Assembly of the Disciples of Christ. They have you giving a keynote. Like, well, what are the ways we begin to empower the church's leaders to actually get to be the church? Because I feel like too often we don't even trust lay right. people. Well, let's let's be totally honest here for a moment. The churches are dying. You have most people and most churches have a small group of people in these giant buildings and where everybody pretty much has gray hair because the young people don't want to come anymore. And so the churches are in crisis. And I would argue that the reason they're in crisis is because the church has become irrelevant mm-hmm. in society. If the church was to become prophetic and begin to explain to the congregants 
what is happening, like what I just mentioned now about how industrial prison complex imprisons Latinos so that, you know, we who have um, um, our retirement funds and have um, stock in these companies could, could live a nice retirement. Um, if, if we say these things, yes, we probably will lose um, some of the congregants who come to church to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. But I will bet you dollars to donuts that you will begin to attract um, the young uh, people who are socially minded, the, the millenniums that we keep saying they don't want to come to church, they do want to come to church. The gospel just has to be good news about something that the world's actually facing. Exactly. Not something about, you know, we got to get away from preaching purely about personal piety and start actually helping our members and our churches do their faith in a way that turns the world upside down. Mm -hmm. You know, when the early church did this, Acts tells us, and God added to their numbers. And maybe God's not adding to our numbers because why add to a dying institution? Mm -hmm. We need to revolutionize the churches. And I know this is scary because I know, you know, I used to be a pastor and I know that, you know, my, my salary is dependent on those ties from Miss Ernestine, who's 80 years old and, you know, loves Donald Trump. and loves Donald Trump Just because Alan West book. Yeah. <laughs> But, but it's just split over who to vote for in the primary. Absolutely. But, but, but the problem is, do we want that to be the church of the future? Or do we want um, young blood and young ideas? Um, you know, when you ask young people, when they think of Christians, what do they think of? And the number one answer is, you know, people who hate, you know, people who hate um, gays, who hate immigrants, who hate, you know, black people. We're in trouble. Yeah. We really are. Um, so I'm not sh surprised that many of our churches are dying and collapsing. Mm -hmm. But we have, I think, uh, an opportune moment to not only turn that around, but change the face of Christianity in such a way that, that, that it could revolutionize this country and the world mm -hmm. just by being faithful mm -hmm. of following the example of Jesus. And, and making justice the center of of of, of what we do. Yeah, uh, that's, that's powerful. And I and to me, one of the things that made liberation theology start to make sense. I mean, I grew up Baptist, where I feel guilty still if I don't read the Bible and pray every day. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, if it's just two chapters, then you you wonder. You need three at least for the Trinity. So um, the the to me, when it started to make sense was when I heard the stories behind the early liberation theologians, that those texts weren't some priest who studied somewhere, but those are theological texts coming out of base communities. Right. And I wonder what it would look like for churches in the first world to, to recenter their community and their mission and values around just picking the text up with the least of these in their community and seeking to embody it. Absolutely. I, I think one of the, one of the, one of the, the, the tragedies is that the Bible has been captured by the academy and by the professionals when, in fact, you know, the, the sayings of Jesus were meant for the common folk. Mm -hmm. And we have lost that, you know, of, of, of it being um, a, a book for the people and for the people to wrestle with and for them to get it wrong as well. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. You know, God is not afraid when we get it wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, but the wrestling and the struggling is what builds the faith. Yeah, the a couple of days ago at one of our like little demonstrations of the smart classroom interviews, I was talking with Harvey Cox about his mm -hmm. new book, and in it he he told a story. He said, you know, the first time I got arrested, which is a good question to ask Christians when the last time was, mm -hmm. um, I, they had segregated prisons, and I was ordained, but most of the young African American men who were arrested with me were somewhere else. And the prison guard came over and said, well, can I get a, they wanted a Bible. Can you believe that? <laughs> they sing and rolling up, right? They want a Bible to borrow his church. And one of them said they're, they can read and they're going to, they're going to preach. And I thought, well, it can't hurt anything. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Harvey's thinking, no, that's exactly the thing you don't understand is that the Bible really is that dangerous to these oppressive domination mm -hmm. systems 
And uh, what the church has been doing is shielding it, the, the actual body of Christ from encountering that message. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, that, and, that, and we need to, and I think we, when I say we, ministers, academics, need to get out of the way and let the message of justice, which is foundation of biblical text, just ring out. Mm-hmm. And people will follow and people will do. Mm-hmm. So, so here in encountering uh, ministers, leaders from different regions and stuff, what uh, what are some uh, moments or, or, or conversations that have you excited about what's what what could happen if we um, really uh, wake up to the situation and uh, and turn back to the the gospel? Yeah. Well, I'm you know I think what was the most exciting thing um, for me was after I gave my talk uh, on the theology of hopelessness mm-hmm. and everyone is in lamentation and gnashing of teeth and there's no hope and everybody's kind of really sad then the respondents came and they really wrestled with the text and they began to talk of how they are doing the gospel and then i had the last word and, and i think my last word was you know while you know i appreciate everything they're doing but most people when i talk about hopelessness they basically are trying to um to ask me you know you know what needs to be done for me to have hope you know, so, so, so they're trying to fix me, mm-hmm. you know, because as a good Christian, you're supposed to have hope. And here I am preaching hopelessness. And, and my response is, and, and, you know, I looked at the at the respondents uh, to my talk who are all actively engaged in the work of justice and said, you know, when they cease to be the exception and become the norm for the church. Then and only then may a glimmer of hope begin to develop in my soul. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was exciting because, you know, as much as I talk about this hopelessness, I speak for, I speak of it because all too often I think the church in a rush to get to Easter fails to spend time in the Saturday of, of, of death. And, 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 and not knowing if there's going to be resurrection mm-hmm. and that hopelessness of Saturday. So while I dwell in that, because that's where the vast majority, I think, of the world's marginalized live, um, you know, I, 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 I feel encouraged that after my talk, there were many individuals who were willing to also dwell in that space so that they could be authentic mm-hmm. to those who are also suffering. Mm-hmm. We, we need to really recapture, I think, lamentations in our faith tradition mm-hmm. and not just skip over that book because it's too sad. Mm-hmm. So as a, when you're teaching people, doing their MDs, preparing for ministry, what kind of questions are you hoping when, when they spent time with you, they carry into where, as a counselor, a minister, mm-hmm. whatever the communities they serve? Here's the question I, I usually stress with my students and that is do you do justice do you do uh, do you do uh, works to bring about a more just society because you think you're going to win or do you do it because you have no other choice mm-hmm. when we think we're going to win then it's very easy to do the right thing it's very easy to to um to, to have hope but when there is no hope and the battle is lost and this doesn't seem like there's any way you're going to win, um, do you still fight for justice? Mm-hmm. And many people, part of middle class privilege is that we can avoid fighting for justice because it's a lost cause. But for the oppressed, they have no choice but to continue struggling for mm-hmm. life. And if we're going to be in solidarity with the oppressed, then we have to stand and struggle with them, even though we know that what we're doing, as like, as the author of Ecclesiastes would say, it's all vanity and meaningless at the end. Mm-hmm. So, so that's what I'm hoping that students uh, walk away with, that they fight for justice, not because they think they're going to win, but because they, as Christians, they have no other choice but to fight for justice. Yes. That's powerful. Thank you so much for joining the podcast. One more time, tell us the new book. Oh, the new book is um, The Politics of Jesus, um, A Political Theology. All right. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you very much.